Good morning, everybody. Happy morning. We are in Genesis chapter six. us in your word and that you still continue to guide us, direct us, and instruct us through your word. Uh, be with us in this class as we uh, study uh, the book of Genesis and give us wisdom from your Holy Spirit that we may encourage one another in faith, be led to know you better and to love you and love our neighbors as ourselves, but above all, to receive your love for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Verse 5, uh, which we did manage to get to last week. Verse 5, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, we said how we have a, a triple affirmation of just how bad things are. We have every intention of his heart of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every only and continual. Uh, that's how bad things have gotten uh, since the fall of Adam and Eve. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. We talked about that as well. And uh, the, the anthropomorphism involved. Uh, so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens for I'm sorry that I've made but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, so uh, th this sets up for the very next section. We know it's a new section because this has been the, the heading of the previous section. These are the generations. So we've had the generations of heaven and earth uh, in 2 verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. We've had the generations of Cain in chapter four. Uh, and let's see. Oh, no, we, we've had the generations of Adam in five, right? And then um, uh, now, now we get the generations of Noah. I thought there was one more. Do we get the generations? Of, well, generations of Adam encompasses. Uh, the the genealogy through Seth. Okay, so so now the generations of Noah, and we can take this as as a unit. We'll we'll read from nine uh, to the end. Uh, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. <coughs> Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in this ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. 
Also take with you every sort of food that's eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So I gave you a homework assignment. How many animals, how many of, of each animal did, did Noah take into the ark? Two. Two. Uh -huh. Seven pair. <laughs> so we, we read in chapter six, two, but if you read the whole account, which I encourage you to do, uh, you have in seven verse two, take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, of all clean animals. Um, th th this I, I bring to your attention partly uh, for the sake of if you're ever involved in a Bible trivia game, <laughs> I don't want you to, to, to miss that. You have to mess up. That's right. I want you to get that pie uh, for, for your, your trivial pursuit wedge or your date wedge for your pie. Um, can anybody play that game anymore? Uh, it, it's a game from the 80s. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Boomer, I think, said. <laughs> yeah. Millennial. Millennials talk about trivial pursuit. Uh, but the, the, the other thing to, to say about that is, remember, these, these original books of the Old Testament, certainly the books of Moses, were written primarily not to be read, but to be heard. And this is very much a mark of morality that... Uh, uh, you, 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 have, you have duplication of details. You have repetition. The kinds of things that if you were to write in uh, an essay for your English class, the teacher is going to strike a, a, a red line through and say, you already said this. You already said this. Okay. Um, this is not a contradiction so much. The, the biblical writer knows what he's doing. But we, we see this not only in, in Old Testament scripture, which is a, a primarily oral culture, but you, you see it in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, where when you get to that detail again in the telling of the story, the detail gets changed slightly, or even by a lot. And what does that do to the hearer? I mean, this is just a few lines later from when it said two of every animal. And now all of a sudden it says seven of every clean, seven pairs of every clean. What, what, what does the hero do? Yes. Isn't that adding more detail? Like in, and it, it reinforces the, uh, the original story and then it adds more detail. Like we, yeah, it, we need a little bit extra for the clean animals for sacrifice and whatnot. Right, it, it, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's uh, more color you might say, uh, but, but also in telling it slightly differently, but by postponing the, the, the more precise number to later, it keeps people's attention. And wait, wait, didn't you say two earlier? Oh, well, oh, it's seven of every clean, which would also be two. Two by two. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how good your math seven is, pair. but if you have seven, you've also got two. <laughs> Dennis is the math uh, expert. Is that right? <laughs> you, you coach the kids in math. Right. If I got seven of something, that means I have two of it too. Sure. Is, that, is that correct? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, should, uh, I I'm, 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 all I know is Jesus, as my, my children will tell you. And I, you know, try to apply first aid in a situation. No, no, no. We got to ask mom about that. You just know about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, you're still going to bleed to death. <laughs> so. Um, but, but, but that is uh, very much uh, a, a, a fact, especially when you read the Psalms and the prophets do this all the time. The Proverbs is full of these, right? Three things do I hate uh, about, about my people. And, and, and then uh, make that four, <laughs> right? Uh, so but, but that's a very effective technique when, when you're telling a story, when it's for, for the purpose of being heard. Uh, and, and that also informs the church's practice. I mean, think about it. Every year, we, you know, for certain Sundays, we hear the exact same stories. We're going to hear the Christmas story every year. And it's not like we don't have enough other stories to tell so that we, we could wait every seven years to tell the Christmas one. But the Christmas one is so important, we tell it every year. And at the same time, 
every year it comes with a sermon that's different from the previous year's sermon. So there's there's repetition within variety in, in, in the church's practice, and that, that's a very good thing. So uh, but before I start in on verse 9 and following, having heard that much of the account, what questions or comments do, do you all have? Well, what kinds of things would, would you all like to focus in on? Nothing. We, 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 we know this story so well. God didn't make a mistake. Okay, God didn't make a mistake. We, we talked about that last week, that when he said uh, he's sorry that he made man, it grieved him to his heart, that it's not that God has changed, but that creation has and, and so it's it's earned his displeasure. Uh huh. I wasn't here last week, but when the Philium came along, you know the demons, you know. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. How much related to this was that part of man's fall that they came in, and or is that an extra corruption thrown in that relates to why he had to destroy everything? So. Last time, the, the short answer is we, we entertained, uh, we explored some various options that Bible scholars have uh, proposed for, for understanding who these Nephilim are and who these sons of God are. And the, 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 the best, most, I, I think, persuasive theory is that uh, the, the sons of God would be the, the faithful ones, the, the, the sons in, in, in Seth's line. Who, who have had the promise of the seed preserved, and they step out of that, that position of faithfulness to take as their wives uh, any they chose. And they, they took daughters of man, that is to say, the, the, the unbelieving, of the, of the unbelievers, and this only compounded the, uh, the, the, the problem and the wickedness that was, that was in the earth. So, I mean, it, it, it's a lesson. I mean, we, we see throughout the Old Testament the, the danger of, a, of, of the believer, of, of the wise Solomon, right? Taking as wives uh, women who worship other gods, who lead him astray and lead him to set up altars and shrines to pagan gods. Um, uh, but, but then in the New Testament... Right? And, and, and we already have in the early church the, the, the challenge of uh, a believing spouse married to an unbelieving spouse. It, it, it sets up a, 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 a tricky situation, and, and, and Paul has to address that in, in, in the First Corinthians writing. Um, so that, that I think is, you, you know, I was thinking about this after class last week, that you know, here's the theme that, that's already there in the very first chapter of Genesis, where God makes all the creatures, e even the plants, according to what? According to their own kinds. And see, that'll be carried over into the laws of Moses, where you, you, you don't mix things. Um, I don't know about you, but, but you realize all of you are sinning right now, those of you who are wearing polyester. That is in the Old Testament law. You, 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 you weren't to wear... Uh, clothing made of two different kinds of fabric. Yeah, because because that's that's a mixing of of two things that weren't meant to be mixed. I mean, I mean, of of, of course that that that's part of the the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, and it isn't part of the moral law that applies to all people at all times. But this is how important that this this idea of staying in your lane. <laughs> Of of re remaining true to the to, to the position God has put you in, and and see here what do we have? We have people that were granted the privilege of being born in the line that carried the seed, the promised seed, and and, and they're turning their back on that and marrying those who reject that promise of the seed. <coughs> that that that's kind of the idea, um, and we have all those warnings in Scripture from from Christ Himself that. Uh, what is what is the church supposed to be? Pure, Pure right? Uh, we are to be the salt of the earth, right? That that if the church ceases to be the church for the world, ceases to be the one saving alternative to the world, 
then there's no real reason for any of the world to keep on going. I mean, the, the, the way Jesus talks, the, the, the only reason the world is preserved to this day is we've got a church praying for it. And we've got a means by which members of that unbelieving world can be brought into the kingdom, can be saved. But if the church itself ceases to be the church, then what, 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 what do you expect but a situation like this one where God simply wipes it all out? There's, there's nothing worth keeping anymore. And, and so that, that, that the importance of the church not compromising with the world as the, the sons of God did here, if, if that is the correct way of, of reading that. And we talked about why it's probably not the, the correct interpretation to read it as as angels having uh, relations with, with humans. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of God using water to destroy the world versus some other method you know, to destroy the Yeah, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let's, uh, we, we first, we've got to build the boat. Okay. Let's, let's get the, bo the boat built first. Uh, and then, then we'll talk about the significance of the water. Yeah, Marcella. That, that, com that comment answers the question that I had on... You know, it says, men sin, and then the Lord said, not just let's worry about humans, but he's upset with animals, creatures, birds, like what do birds have Yeah, to do? right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good. So, let me, I'll take that in turn, but it's good of the ESV to do this. They preserve the original Hebrew phrasing in, in two places at least. It's all flesh. That, that's literally the Hebrew, all flesh. Now, if, if some of you have another translation, I don't think NIV goes with flesh there. Who, who has NIV? Dan, do you have NIV? I can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who, who? No flesh. What, 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 what does it have? Um, are we talking about 20? How about um, well, verse 13? Oh, 13. Um, 12 or 13. Twelve, I think. Oh, thirteen. Yeah, so either God one. said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth. All people. See, that's not, yeah, that's narrowing the meaning of flesh. Because the text itself interprets the word for us by saying flesh refers to any living creature, not just the human ones. Yeah, so this would be in, in the Bible's way of understanding living creatures, it would include pretty much everything but the plants. And the fish. Not yeah, the, the, the fish aren't going to get wiped out. That's right. That's right. So, Another fish story. Only if Nemo fought, but obeys his dad, though. It's true. In her version, it says, for the earth. And then you had read on the earth, which would eliminate the fish. The fish wouldn't be uh, covered in this flesh or any, any yeah, creature, okay. creature right. on the earth. So the birds would be included because they don't have any place to land. Right. They're, they're, they're going to run out of trees. Yeah. Right. <laughs> would stay in the sea. Yeah. But 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 the point is that now all, all of creation is is being cleansed, and 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 this is. Um, Sin introduces into the world this disruption of the original balance. And it, it, it's impossible for us to understand or to get at just how this happens. We just know that it has happened so that everything is, is, is not right. Not just the relationship among human beings but even the relationship between human beings and the rest of nature and the relationships within nature. So what do you have in, in Romans chapter 8? You have Paul talking about how all of creation groans. It's not just that we groan, we human beings groan. All of creation groans and longs to see the redemption of the sons, the redemption of our bodies when it will be revealed that we are the sons of God. That, that, that the sin problem affects everything. Um, so, yeah, yeah, Sarah. Would this also kind of strengthen the we were born with original sin because it wasn't just the older people that he killed. I mean, there yeah. were babies, there were, right? I mean, they were, right. they all were sinful. 
<laughs> right, yeah. Now, I guess my only hesitation in, in, in using this particular example as proof of that is that so often in Scripture, to take Paul talking about the, the history of the Israelites in the wilderness and how all were baptized into Moses, all were fed uh, by, the, by the, all eight of the manna, all drank from the spiritual rock that is Christ. But not all were saved. And, 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 and how, how many died here, how many died there, and, and so forth. And it, it's, it's, well, how, how about, how about, how about we, we, we go there? I think that's as good as an example as any. I can, I can give you two or three others that I think will be familiar to you. This is um, 1 uh, Corinthians... Uh, 10, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, and, and this has <laughs> got to be one of the <laughs> uh, biggest understatements of the Bible, with most of them, God wasn't pleased. Um, who actually ends up making it to the wilderness of that first generation that left Exodus? Joshua. Yeah, I think two. Joshua and Caleb. So most of them. Most of them didn't make it. All but two is, uh, is summed up as most. Uh, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, to think, when, when God brings punishment on His people for, let's say, a group, a, a subset's sin, everybody gets affected. And, and, and so it's not to say that every single one of these people that perished in the wilderness died an unbeliever. That, that He only struck down the, the unbelieving ones. Right, that they, they all got, or, or, or how about when, when Jesus is um, uh, challenged with the example of the Tower of Siloam that fell and, and killed so many people that fell on it? And what was the question? The question was, uh, uh, what, what did they do to deserve that punishment from God? And, and what was Jesus' answer? I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Right? So in, instead of sort of figuring out, okay, what, what exactly did they do to get this? Some of them may have gone to heaven, right? But that we will die of something, and sooner than we may think, should lead all of us to repent now. That should be your lesson from any natural catastrophe. And we, we can talk about that more in the case of the flood. There's a lot to draw out from the, from, from the flood that... Uh, I think speaks to some of the more common objections that, that are leveled against against the faith. Um, but but you, you see what I mean, Sarah? You, you're, you're absolutely... I mean, obviously, original sin is taught by the Scripture. We saw that already in the genealogy of Adam, that Adam gives birth to those who are after his likeness, Adam's likeness, no longer after God's likeness. And, and what, what, what Paul will say is, look... We know there is sin from the beginning, from Adam and Eve's fall at least, because death reigned from that time until Moses. Now, now why does he set up that time period to talk about? Because from Adam to Moses, we don't have an explicit direct command from God for the people to be breaking, like, like Adam and Eve did. The next time we'll get that is when God speaks to his people at Sinai. And yet, that didn't get him off the hook. You didn't tell us, God, that you, you don't like cheating. You, you didn't tell us, God, that you, you, you don't like killing people. Right? Uh, you didn't, you, but, but still, he, he, lives, were, people die. People die. And so I, I always go there to talk about, see, the, what, what's the argument against um, infants having sin? It's that they don't know better. They haven't, been, they haven't been taught. They, they, they don't have the explicit command to break yet. And, and here's Paul saying the same thing. Well, neither did all those people between Adam and Moses, and God, you know, they, they were still sin. They were still accountable for their sin. 
Um, anything else? All right. So let, let's let's take some of these um, these words here and, and get a better handle on Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. What might be the objection to that wording? He sounds perfect. He sounds perfect. Perfect in the sense of sinless. Now, was Noah sinless? No. No, no of course not. Uh, we, we, we're certainly going to get an account, an incident post-flood, uh, post-Diluvian, uh, that, that will show that, that Noah was by no means perfect. Um, so, so what does it mean to be righteous? Oh, and, and incidentally, uh, we don't have commas in the original Hebrew. So this in his generation could be taken to go with both things. Righteous in his generation, blameless in his generation. When you put the comma in there, which ESV guys have done, I don't know if you're, those of you reading NIV or New King James have a comma there. But what the ESV translators want, the way they want us to read it is the inner generation goes only with the blameless. It, it, and that, that, that's, that's fine. And that, that's, as, you know, it's, it's got as much going for it as, as the other. But what does being a righteous man mean? So would it tie back to what you were saying earlier about sons of God? Uh, not intermarrying with other e, e, outside. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Although, I, I'd like to think that probably belongs more to the blameless in this generation part. Let's treat it as two things. He's righteous, and he's blameless in his generation. Who have we seen before this that we might also describe as righteous? Enoch. And there's more than one. Enoch. What did Enoch do? He walked with God. Now, again, does that mean Enoch was without sin? What does it mean about Enoch that he walked with God? What? He's acquainted with them. He trusted. He, he trusted him. It, it, it comes back to faith. To be righteous is, is to believe, is to trust. And so Enoch walked with God in the sense that absolutely an essential part of faith is trusting that God is good to you, will be good to you, will save you. But that's not all that faith is. Faith is also trusting that what God says to do is good for you to do. That, that He's not out to get you. That he's, he, he tells the truth. And so when He says, don't do this, you may not know why it's such a bad thing not to do this, but God's telling me not to do this, and therefore, knowing that God is good, knowing that God loves me, it must be for my good not to do this. That's walking with God. It's going where God leads me. And if I'm walking with God and following Him, then I'm going to end up where God is. If I'm not walking with God, if I'm not trusting Him, I'm following someone else, I will end up in a place God isn't. Walking with God. But see, that's not necessarily sinlessness. He still sins. But what does he do with his sins? Repent. Yeah, repents. I mean, to, to bring in kind of New Testament language, it's a life of repentance and faith. Does that same thing apply for like when David said, he's a man after my own heart? I think so. Because obviously David is not pure in the sense that, that he, he does everything right. Um, and, and see, that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind that when the Bible talks about the righteousness of a person, we immediately want to think in terms of quantity. That, that Noah must have, uh, he must have done a whole bunch of good stuff. And there must have been a whole bunch of evil that he avoided doing. And guess what? The Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. We have hardly any data points to, to make that judgment of Noah. What do we have? What, what do we see in Noah's relationship with God over the next three chapters? Noah did what God asked. Noah does what God tells him to do. And God tells him to do some pretty ridiculous things. <laughs> I mean, it is silly and preposterous what God calls him to do, and Noah just doesn't. You know, I think the old, I, I, I don't know, can, can we say his name anymore? Um, 
he, 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 he was on a, a show called, well, the show also had his name in it, but uh, Mr. Huxtable, mm -hmm. right, okay. So, you know, the old Noah routine, right, that, that he used to do. Do, do we not know this? I just assume we're all, we, we all know our stand-up routines. Uh, but, but that whole back and forth between Noah and God, I mean, it brings out how crazy this is that what, what God is asking him to do. Now, it's uh, an insult to Noah. We don't have Noah talking back to God like that at all. That's the point. He's righteous. God tells him to do this crazy thing, and he does it. And he does it. Um, so, so that's to be righteous. N not, not to be... Well, and how about the blameless in his generation? Again, that blameless part. We, we can't help but hear as, this guy did nothing wrong. But what, what about that? Is that a relative thing? It's just yeah, and it, especially that it's got in his generation. That, that this is a biblical way of speaking. I've, I've, I've shared this example before that when we get later on in Genesis and it tells us that God hated Esau, that he loved Jacob. And see, we immediately hear that hate word and think, oh, he, he, he had malice toward him, he cursed him, that kind of thing. But that's just a biblical way of saying he preferred Jacob to Esau. Jacob hated Leah and loved Rachel. But obviously he did not hate Leah. He grinned and bore it apparently many times. <laughs> uh, no, but that's just a biblical way of saying he preferred Rachel to Leah. You see? And so likewise to say blameless in his generation, we hear that word blameless today as meaning without any fault whatsoever. And this is instead saying, oh, Paul does this. Paul will call himself blameless. Paul, Paul, Paul will say, uh, with regard to the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. Now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean he never sinned once? No, but he said, as far as that kind of righteousness gets you, I did it. I pulled it off. But I wasn't completely blameless because there was one little problem. My heart was full of hate towards God. Just just one little thing. Just one little So close! So close to being blameless, except he hated God. Uh, and, and his son. So, so likewise, blameless in his generation here means in this world that has spiraled out of control, that is full of wickedness and violence, Noah stands out. Noah stands out as, as, as extraordinary. And so, we Christians have been called to be that. Um, how, how many times again, salt of the earth, light, right? A, uh, you know, a beacon on a shining hill, that kind of thing. That that uh, God, Jesus calls us to uh, do good works in such a way that that the world gives glory to our heavenly Father, right? Uh, not that the world sees our good works and believes in us. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, how often that happens, right, that, that, that our examples, we, we parade our examples around such that, 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 that people put all their, 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 their trust in God in us. And then when, when such an example, such a leader fails, and how many public ministers have we seen involved in, in scandals and, and, and the people that followed those people, see, fell away. See, uh, you know, obviously, ho horrible things have, have, have been done, and, and you know, we had not that long ago, it came to light that this you know, very effective apologist for Christianity was for decades involved in sexual predation, right? And, I mean, I, I don't know how you have a, you know, it, what, what, what board is approving the, the setting up of massage parlors around the world as a evangelism, uh, as an evangelism project, but anyway... Uh, but, but see, how many people, because that fell away, have fallen away from the faith, but, but the problem there is, what was their faith in to begin with? Preacher. Right, as in the preacher, see? Uh, and, and at the same time, our, our, our good works should show the world that God's love in our life makes a difference. That's, that, that's the place that, 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 that our, our good works have, our, our blamelessness has. In, in leading people to Christ, they see, whoa, they've, 
you know, kind of like Lincoln's line about Grant, right? And, and say, you know, do you know, uh, uh, you know, Grant's been known to uh, uh, drink uh, whiskey a lot, right, or whatever. And, and, and Lincoln says, uh, well, whatever brand I'd like, some myself, <laughs> right? Th that, that's the kind of effect that we ought to have, right? You know, I'm not sure w what that Christian is drinking, but but I'd like a bottle of it myself. That 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 kind of thing. Uh, so, but but. All the while, all honest about our own uh, imperfection, our own sinfulness, uh, such that, that it's, it's not me, it's, it's Him. Uh, our strength is, is outside of ourselves, it's in Christ. Okay, um, and, and, and there it is, Noah walked with God, see, j just as it said with Enoch, just as it said with Enoch. He had three sons, uh... It's, I think it's in seven that the order is um, put differently. So is Shem the oldest? It, it's, it's not clear because you have uh, a, a, a different order later. Uh, but it, it, everybody know what, what prejudice or discrimination against Jews is known as? Anti-Semitism. So that comes from Shem. See, uh, Shem is, is the, the son of Noah. That, that the, the promise of the seed will be carried through. But when this gets converted into a, a name in Greek and then Latin, Greek and Latin don't have the sh sound. And so it becomes sin, Semite. So, but really Shemite. Uh, you, you know, uh, in, in, in Hebrew, the, that word for, for peace, shalom. shalom. But then we, we have so many towns in, in the world called Salem. See? Yeah, not, not Shalem, but, but, but Salem. But, but it's, it's, it's from, uh, from Shalom. I thought it was referring to sailors. To sailors? Yeah, Salem. <laughs> oh, terrible. Salem. I like it. I like it. So. Uh, okay. Verse 11. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Uh... I, I, I think that this is serves as as a, as a corrective to, to something I see more and more today. Uh, I've I've probably been guilty of it myself in preaching and teaching from time to time. That to, to talk about the sinful world, our own sinfulness, in terms of brokenness. The Bible never talks that way. It doesn't talk about our being broken. It talks about our being corrupt. What, what difference might that make? If we talk about this broken world, or uh, I, my own brokenness. If you have the ability to be corrupt, you're not broken. Yeah. You be together to do something bad. To yeah. do anything. Well, okay. Yeah, very good. Very good. What, what, what else? What what, what, what kind of connotation does, does does talking only of our own brokenness uh, is there's no choice corrupt is a choice yeah, okay yeah I think that, that's very much part of it too yeah that there, there's there's a responsibility you know Dennis was kind of saying the same thing that there's a responsibility that, that we bear for being corrupt in, in a way that that broken takes the the blame away right if if, if you're broken that suggests you're a victim. But the problem is, we're not the victim of sin. We're perpetrators of it. And so corrupt or twisted, distorted, that's, that, that's certainly the more biblical way of talking about it. And, and, and gets at the, the problem in a much better way than brokenness. Brokenness kind of lets us off the hook. It goes back to original sin, really. Yeah, which was not... The way God made us. God made us originally good, perfect, holy in His image. It's not even Satan's fault. He's complicit. But who did the sinning? Adam and Eve. We did. We corrupted ourselves. And we willingly participate in sinning, sinning more sins. Uh, behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way. See, they did it to themselves. They corrupted their way on the earth. Things just got worse and worse and worse. Going back to what you said earlier, does that mean the animals 
included in that, or is this specific to sinful people? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, I don't know how you attach kind of moral responsibility uh, to, to, to the animals, but certainly the, the animals have turned, nature has turned, as a result of the imbalance that sin has introduced into the, in, into the creation. Did we, we follow that? I mean, again, can't explain out. Did it somehow, you, you know, b before the sin, uh, our DNA looked one way, and, and after that, you, you know, something got, got turned off, uh, a, a chromosome or, or something. Uh, I, I don't know about that, but certainly sin introduced into the world a, a, an unbalancing of the perfect balance that it was originally created with. Well, it, and, it, could it be looked at too, because if you say, well, how do the animals themselves have sin? They don't have souls. There's no, you know, it's only people. It would be similar to if you're tending a garden, the person is in charge of the garden. Mm. Oh, tending. yeah, yeah, very good. And if the person tends the garden perfectly, so let's say sinlessly, yeah. tends it perfectly, Thing, the garden stays in order and there's not a mess right. and it's a garden. If the person tends it imperfectly, sinful, then the garden becomes a mess. It's still a garden, right? but it's just a disaster. Yeah, it yeah. has no order to it. Nothing right. functions the way it doesn't produce what it should. And so could that be a, sort of a, a, use that as an analogy to how could sinful people end up making the animals sinful? Well, the animals aren't sinful, but right. we were put in charge of them. And if we're screwing it up, yeah, then the, it's going to the, be a mess. The, their place in, yeah. in, in nature is also going to be dislodged. If the yeah. garden becomes such a mess, what do you do? Yeah. You plow it all under and you have to start over. Yeah. And so God's saying, well, we just have to... And, and, and remember what was part of our original calling to exercise dominion. And, and so sin affects that right exercise of dominion so that one of the things that, that starts with the fall is animals now are afraid of us. See, that, that wasn't the original situation. They, they had no reason to be afraid of us. We were made in the image of God and we're going to exercise our dominion in, in, in a way that would be for their good. Um, we, we, we weren't even allowed to eat them in the beginning. And, and, and even at, at this stage in human history, we're still not. All right. Um, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Now, he, he, has, them, he has him make uh, an ark of gopher wood. We, we said, talked about this a little bit last week. What kind of wood is, is gopher? We should know this by now. <laughs> Correct answer. Correct answer. We have no idea. We have no idea. It be so Oh my! Really? Really? Yeah. Isn't it wood you have to go get? Go for it. Ah, terrible. <laughs> Salem. <laughs> uh, so th this is one of those. Uh, there's a fancy word for this in in language class: hopox legomena. That is to say, one of those words that appears only once in all the Bible. And so we've got nothing else to go on to interpret this word gopher, and that's why the the translators just leave it as the Hebrew word gopher. Uh, we're, we're told how, uh, we're given the dimensions of, of the ark and so forth. Uh, cubits, anyone want to venture what a cubit is? It's about a meter or so, isn't it? Maybe. It's like Depends on to whose cubit it, it is. Elbow to wrist, right? Elbow, yeah, elbow to tip of finger, actually. Yeah, elbow to tip of finger. So that's obviously going to be different for different people. And so most study Bibles, when they do the uh, the weights and measures chart, will plug in a number like uh, one and a half yards, something like that. Does, is, does that... Anyway, one guy standing around, and they used his. Yeah, they used his. his best job. Oh, just like uh, all of our our feet and inches, it's it's the king's foot, right? You know, until all that stuff got standardized, you you measured things by the length of the king's foot, and and so was it was it Noah's cubit that these three hundred cubits are? Uh, we we don't know, but uh, and and we know the place in Kentucky is based on the Bible, I and mean, then a lot of imagination has made a replica uh, of, of, of the ark, but, but this is all we're given. However, it's quite a bit all of a sudden, quite a bit of 
uh, of precise description. What might that tell us? That God goes into this level of detail with Noah about the ark. When else does he do this kind of thing? The temple. The temple. The tabernacle first in Exodus. I mean, the whole second half of Exodus is nothing but precise descriptions of how the thing's to be built. And then it gets repeated, you know, everything God says to do, then we get it again in terms of Moses did it just that way. You know, so, uh, but then again with the building of the temple under Solomon, we get this level of description. Why might that be? Why these particular events get described? Salvation. Salvation Salvation is at stake. That's right. Remember, what was lost when Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden? What was the most important thing that that now meant? It's where they dwelt with God. It's where they had direct fellowship with God. And so now here with the ark, God is having Noah build a place where where certain people will still be safe in God's presence. And then he'll do it again when he sets up the tabernacle. And again when he when he sets up the the, 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 the temple under Solomon. But then likewise, in the New Testament, what, what replaces the tabernacle and the temple in the New Testament? Christ does, yes. And Christ has a body. Guess what that is? I'm looking at it. We're His body. We're living stones in the temple. And that's why, again, the, the whole Sermon on the Mount can be read as Jesus giving very precise descriptions about how this new temple, which is now a community, not a building, but, but, but the people uh, that make up the church, how they are to live. Uh, Paul and his letters, John and his letters, right? They don't just say, okay, uh, you're, you're now the body of Christ, uh, live however you see fit. No, they give, we, we, we get a slice of that today in the Ephesians reading, don't we? Where, where, where Paul is going to say, you know, here's precisely how Christians are to live. This is exactly what the, 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 the place of God's salvation looks like. Um, so, uh, the, these, these detailed... Uh, you know, the, the ark, you can think of it as uh, a floating Eden. I mean, th- that, that's what it's going to be. I mean, everything else is getting wiped out, but here, in this one place, is the place where God is is preserving his creation and, and still maintaining a favorable relationship with it. Um, in, 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 any questions about that? He also shut the door. Yeah, that's coming. That's coming, Rose. <laughs> is, Hang on. Is there a, a, I'll say secondary, when, when we read the Bible, and a lot of people criticize the Bible for this, they say, well, the Bible's not history, right? They'll say, it doesn't give an exact account of every single thing that happened, so we just dismiss it because, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it, it wasn't written how we would write a history book. And we say from a religious standpoint that God just tells us what we need to know, and that's it, and leaves a whole lot out. Right. And so you might ask yourself, then you say, why do we need to know what the links were? He could have just said, he told Noah, build a big boat, it's going to hold the animals. Yeah, he yeah. could have given the specifics to Noah, but we're told for a specific reason, or maybe multiple reasons. One is calling the importance to it. But I think there's a secondary to it, too, that it's a way to tell, at that time, the future reader, even us today, that the world was more complex than our brains probably give credit to it. Sure. Because I, I, I think that... Because we know so little about it. Yeah. And, and I think so, so we have all these gaps and we just think, oh, how primitive they must have that, been. Well, that's exactly it. Is yeah. I think that we think, well, they're just, they're living in mud huts. Right, and, right, right, but, right. But if you think about yeah. it, the people have been around for a thousand years, at least, because we know yeah, how Yeah, maybe two. Yeah. yeah. We know how. And a lot has happened. I mean, there's been a long time for things to get... To, to the place they are here. That's exactly right. Yeah. And if people are living, let's say not everybody makes it 900 years, but yeah. let's say 400 years. If, if you're an older generation, or generation person sitting in this room and you think to yourself, 
how much did I figure out between the ages of 20 and 80, <laughs> right? Think right, how right. much you would figure out between yeah, 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 yeah. 400. Right. So yeah. I, I guess to wrap my point up, Noah doesn't say, but God, how am I going to build this thing? Right. This right. is ridiculous. Like, no, yeah. no one in human history yeah, exactly. has ever built something big before. Right. And you're asking me to build this giant ship. Yeah, yeah. He just kind of is like, okay, cool, we'll do it. Yeah. And and they don't even talk about that, you know, he labored, you know, mercilessly for years and years to make it happen. And it was such a horrible experience and had to come up with new ideas. No, it was just, okay, we'll just do it. Right. So to me, there there was a lot going on in the world then. That was far beyond yeah, yeah. In, the, in a mud hut. Yeah. <laughs> two, 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 two things. Um, C.S. Lewis was once asked, you know, the, the question we, we all like to think about, uh, if there's one person in living or, or dead that, that you would want to meet, have, have dinner with, who would it be? Lewis said Adam, because he's the wisest man that ever lived. See, see it, it's a fall. It's a fall. Adam was not a caveman. He was endowed with a wisdom that, that none of us can imagine. And, and, we, and we fell from that. Uh, and, and so Lewis gets that right. And, and, and Chesterton makes the point that, you know, against this Neanderthal, uh, primitive uh, uh, man, that, that well, we, we, we go into the caves of these cavemen, and what do we find on the walls? Art. I mean, they're, 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 they're paintings. Yeah. Uh, so just how dumb were these people? Right? They had a culture, and, and, and they, they chose to use what little they had in the way of tools and instruments and implements and so forth to do art. Well, even so, the whole, you know, and of course, we, we, we're the backwards ones because that's the first thing to go when there's budget cuts. <laughs> <laughs> right? But even the because, art is whatever God decided to leave behind, right? So yeah, and that, that, yeah that's whatever we that. found. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and to think that, oh, we found everything there is to find about these previous generations, that's right. And we don't even know who killed Kennedy. <laughs> we, 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 don't even, we, we don't even know the source of this known virus. <laughs> Evolutionary science can't tell us that, but it can tell us exactly what happened billions of years ago. Um, okay. The, uh, l l let's end, because yeah, there are several more things I wanted to get to. We'll, we'll save them for, for, for next week. Um, I, I guess a, a, a good point... To, to end on is is this that when when God chooses to save us, He gets very specific. So He does not leave us in the dark or or wondering, doubting, questioning. No, He He makes very specific statements and attaches His promises to them. And so here He is with Noah doing that. I was going to say, you know, with, with with Jonathan's point. See again, we. we we know that the people hearing this for the first time, they have for who knows how long been interacting with God by way of the prescriptions laid out in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and, and, De and Deuteronomy especially. Uh, they, they, they've been uh, worshiping God by way of the, the, the temple, sac the tabernacle sacrifices and so forth. And so when they, when they hear this read to them, proclaimed to them, what do they see? Aha! This is how God has always worked. Right? That, that when He decides to save people, He gets very specific about how He's going to do it. So that there can be no doubt for Noah and his family, this is the place to be when the water starts coming. Right? And so likewise, the promises God attaches to things like baptism, and the hearing of the Gospel, and, and the Lord's Supper, so that we have no doubt, aha, Jesus said, His body and blood are here with this bread and the wine when these words are spoken. Or when, when, when water is applied with these words, uh, you can put it down that your sins are forgiven and you've received the Holy Spirit and that you're saved. Uh, very, very specific. And so we ought not give a free pass to those who uh, choose to worship without regard to what Scripture says as well-meaning as they might be in that endeavor. You see, our, our, our worship ought to flow out of what Scripture actually says, what God actually attaches His promises to, and not just do it any way we, 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 we feel. Yeah, yeah. Um, is the specificity of the ark because God thinks, well, I thought I was clear about not eating this 
for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah th 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 this time around, yeah. Doc learned his lesson from previous. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think because when we get to this section, we, we it resonates so with the, the later sections. Because remember, we said those books of Moses, they're a unit. We've divided them up into books. But they weren't originally. They, they were all one thing. And so this is like the preamble to the giving of the law that will happen in Exodus. And so, aha, here we have, ahead of time, God doing a thing very similar to what he does with Moses in the building of the tabernacle, which is they know the place where God meets them, the, the, the place where he, makes his, he locates his presence so that he can meet with his people despite their sin. And so here, despite their sin, these eight people are going to be saved uh, by way of an ark. And, and what's one of our images for the church? We are the ark. Right? This is the... Oh, well... All right, we'll, we'll save that for next week. I've got <laughs> eight other ideas that uh, I share. Can't, can't do them all at once. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we uh, give you thanks and praise for your faithfulness to your promise. You promised that you would redeem the world through the seed of the woman. And despite the, the great wickedness and violence that the world fell into, you still preserved Noah and his family, that the promise might be kept, uh, and kept ultimately by your son Jesus, born of Mary. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would, uh, hearing these uh, accounts of your way with our ancestors, we might be strengthened in our faith in you to continue to, to be good and gracious toward us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.